so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's midnight on a still March night in 2012, and a fire is crackling inside Ken's hut in remote northern New South Wales. 20 armed tactical police are quietly surrounding the timber farmhouse on a Gloucester property, trying not to spook nearby cows as they use surrounding trees to edge their way closer. Tonight has been 2,466 days in the making, a chance to capture Australia's most wanted man, a suspected double murderer who has led police on the longest manhunt in this country's history. For the last seven years, Malcolm Naden has been an invisible shadow in the bush, living rough in some of Australia's harshest terrain, surviving on supplies stolen from rural homes and animals killed in the wild. But the Dubbo man, finally, has nowhere left to run. And as camouflaged police lay in wait, a heavily bearded, barefoot and muddy Naden opens the hut's back door. Police! Don't move! Wanted for the murders of Christy Scholes and Letitia Nolan in his hometown, the ghost of Barrington Tops is finally in custody. As Naden starts talking, the true depravity of his crimes will shock even the most hardened detectives. He reveals himself as a cold-hearted killer, with no empathy, no remorse, and a strange request to be locked away for life. Once you kill somebody, you do it again. You, you just won't care. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Malcolm Naden's victims were both in their mid-twenties. They were both mothers. Letitia Nolan had four kids, and Christy had two. They were both linked to the Naden family. Killed just six months apart, after coming into contact with the 38-year-old at his grandparents' Dubbo home. Many of the details of their deaths were so brutal they were suppressed by the courts. We know what happened to them in detail because Naden admitted to it in a chilling 25-page handwritten confession that he wrote for police from his prison cell after being caught in 2012. Both of Naden's victims were strangled to death. He wrote about not just how he murdered them, but how he felt afterwards. I sat in the back briefly, just looking at her. She was so peaceful, so quiet, so empty. I've never seen a body so relaxed, not even in sleep. She crossed from life to death in an instant. She was just gone. I wanted her to say something, to speak again, maybe even just a movement. But death makes no sound. It has no movements. It's fine. But don't be fooled. There is no remorse in Naden's reflections. He just knows that what he did was wrong. I'd like to say I feel something for the victims, but it would be a lie. By the time Naden was captured, seven years after the murders, he was tired. He was glad it was over, relieved. Much to the detective's surprise, he was looking forward to life behind bars. But I have no intentions of ever wanting to leave prison. This is my home now. This is where I live. And this is where I will die. Today's guest, Dimity Clancy, was the journalist who first acquired and published Naden's confession in 2016. Her exclusive story for A Current Affair earned her a prestigious Walkley Award. She joins us now. Timothy, I want to start with a woman called Christy Scholes. Can you tell us about her and what she was doing on the night of June 21, 2005? Okay, so she was living in the same house as Malcolm Naden because Malcolm's grandfather was in a hospital in Sydney. 
they loved her. She was Malcolm Naden's cousin's girlfriend. So she was a real part of the family and they asked her to come and stay and look after the house while they were in Sydney. So that's why she was staying in the same house as Malcolm Naden. She had put her two children to bed. She was in the bathroom when Malcolm's come up behind her and strangled her to death there and then. He's then dragged her into his own bedroom, which nobody ever went to. And in there, he has raped her and then he's put her with pillows and blankets around her, as he will say, to make her more comfortable. And then he's fled through his side window. And that's the start of the manhunt. That's that's when he went on the run. But he was not on the police radar. They weren't looking for Malcolm Naden at this point, even though he had committed murder five months before. So the next morning, family members come to the house and they see that the children are there, but they can't find Christy anywhere. So again, it's still raw because it's only five months after Letitia's murder. So they start searching for her, but it's obviously in the back of their minds that they've just done a a similar search five months before. So they call police and police arrive at the house. One of the detectives, Sue Ellen Scott, is the first person to arrive and she goes into the house and is searching for Christy and she actually finds Christy in Malcolm's bedroom but Malcolm's nowhere to be seen. That's when they start looking for him. That's when they know that they need to find him and that's the start of the seven-year manhunt. So as you say, police arrive at this house, they find Christy's body. They had already known that a woman had gone missing that was related to this family but They've arrived there and realised that it was the exact same house that Letitia Nolan had gone missing from. Can you tell us about what they knew at that point about what had happened to Letitia? She was missing. That's all they knew. They hadn't found any trace of her. That's all that they knew is that, that she had gone missing and that the family were desperate to find her. It wasn't until they went in and, and found Christie's body that they realised, hang on, maybe it's Malcolm Naden we're looking for. It all became then about finding him and I don't know how much was in their mind. I mean, of course, they would have connected the dots that Letitia had gone missing, but they just knew they needed to find him in relation to Christy's body because obviously she was in his bedroom. Yeah, and Letitia's still missing. Obviously that house now becomes a crime scene. What did they find in terms of evidence when they scoured that place? In the house they found a whole heap of peepholes. So He'd go into the roof cavity and that was one of Malcolm's trends. He would often go into the roof cavity of places and on top of the bathroom, those old school grates, mm-hmm. you know, like yeah. like an air vent grate, but those old ones, he would peer through those into the bathroom while his relatives were in the shower. Things like that. He had sick obsessions with his relatives and in the lead up to Christie's death, she was receiving handwritten notes from Malcolm that the family had become concerned about, but I don't think that they'd reported it or thought much of it. I mean, Malcolm's a recluse. By that stage, after Letitia's death, he locked his door to the point where his grandmother would leave his meals outside his room. He would only exit and enter the home from the side window of his bedroom. So he just, Mm. he didn't talk to anyone. He had nothing to do with anyone. He was a recluse. And the only real interaction that he had was these handwritten notes to Christy and to other family members as well. Do we know if he sent notes like that to Letitia as well? I don't know. You know, Letitia's murder from his confession was a real opportunistic Mm. murder. They were in the car. She had said that she'll give him a lift to go fishing. They were down at Sandy Beach. And on the way there, he was getting out to, at Sandy Beach to go fishing. On the way there, I think she's asked him a question that he didn't want to be asked about another family member and and that triggered him. And he says that by the time they got to Sandy Beach on the banks of the Macquarie River in Dubbo, he was in an outrage. And so that's what caused him to just grab her from behind because he was sitting in the back seat and strangle her to death. He then realise that he's got to do something with her body. So then they drive further up the road to Butler's Falls. And, you know, the thing about Malcolm's mind that always just fascinated me was along the way, and he talks about it in the confession, is he says he's driving along between Sandy Beach and Butler's Falls and he looks over at 
Letitia, and the shape that she's lying in, she looked uncomfortable in the car. So he moves her to put her body in a more comfortable position. Which is strange because when you start researching about Malcolm and how his brain works, he doesn't seem to have empathy, yet he does stuff like that. He doesn't have empathy and and he has that mind where they don't really have a real ability to feel, as a lot of murderers don't. But there's little glimpses along the way, like even after he shot the cop, he says that he looked back to see if the cop was okay. (laughs) So he's got some sort of conscience, but just little hints along the way, you see them come out in Malcolm in in really weird moments. When police started digging more into Malcolm. What did they find out about him? You've mentioned he was a recluse, that he was a bit creepy. What did he do for work? Why was he at his grandparents? What else did we know about him? So growing up, I think he was trouble for his parents. So his grandparents raised him from a young boy. He worked at the local Dubbo Abattoir as a skinner, I believe. Mm. So he knew how to use tools. He knew how to chop things up. He knew how to skin things. I guess that maybe helped him later on in his bushman life. And then, yeah, he just never really associated with with anyone. But from what I can gather from the family, he was part of Christmas celebrations and things like that. But day to day, no one really had much to do with Malcolm. And then between Letitia and Christie's death, he had a lot of like survival books and researching things like that, that they found in his room once they'd found Christie's body. So was he like waiting for police so he could go on the run? Like what would you think that was for? I don't know. I don't know. But you'd have to think that there was some sort of thought of, I'm going to do it again, you know. Mm -hmm. And and one of the reasons Malcolm says he never wanted to be captured was because he never wanted to kill again. He didn't want to be back in society normally. And another reason why he never wanted to get out of jail is because he never wanted to commit another murder. Again, that sign of conscious. Well, I guess he knew he had it in him. Yeah. So police, after they find Christie's body, they start a search because he's nowhere to be found. What did that look like in the early months? I think they threw a lot at it, but I guess what it shows in those early days is that he was always one step ahead of police and Mm. and the way he would hide and the way he would evade police was clever, you know, and it got to the December. So between the June and December, I'm not sure whether there were some sightings of him. There may have been around town. I'm not sure, but it was at the Dubbo Zoo when he's first detected properly. Yeah, tell us about the weird happenings that started to pop up at the zoo. So there was staff that lived on site at the zoo and they started to notice things like just food in their cupboards were missing and things like that and they'd leave a door locked but they'd come home and it would be open. And the way that he was found there was he was in the laundry of like the living quarters when a cleaner came in and came face to face with him. And I think... She said something like, oh, I'm looking for the fan or something like that, and he just pointed over to the fan. And he had a radio in his hand and he handed her a towel, which she said smelt like somebody who had not showered in many months. Checks out. (laughs) (laughs) But then it became apparent he got out of there once he knew police were were onto him because they obviously then contacted police and police swarmed Dubbo Zoo. He got out of there quick smart, but it became apparent that he was actually living for weeks in the roof cavity of one of those huts, the residential huts on the premises of the zoo. Again, peepholes were found and things like that. So he knew that they were on his tail. So he essentially left and then he wasn't spotted again for for a long time, I think years after that. And he managed to travel under the radar 300 kilometres north up to the Barrington Tops area. Yeah, well, the next time he's spotted is Feb 20th, 2007, And he's at Stewart's Brook and they find blood, which they have his DNA, so they know that he's there. But at that point, I think police started to really understand, like you just touched on, just how well this guy was at surviving. What do we know about what he was doing? Where was he getting food from and that kind of thing? He'd do things like at the zoo, he would raid animal enclosures. So he would take bananas out of the elephant's enclosure. (laughs) He would then raid bins because, you know, you go there as a family to Dubbo Zoo and you'd probably pack some sandwiches for your family but and they'd throw the rest in the bin. Well, he would go in once everybody's left around the barbecue areas and eat bread and food scraps from the bin. And I think that's how he 
for the first few years, that's how he survived. When he had energy and when he was well and fresh on the run, if you like, he he was living a lot in the bush. And he talks about that they were tough days, mm. that getting water was easy, shelter wasn't too bad, but getting food was hard. And that's when he started, you know, a few years in breaking into homes and but again, like he's spying on people along that time too, you know. And a lot of that terrain up there is tough terrain, but scattered in the terrain are those huts that people use a lot as weekenders. So mm. some of them would be vacant for months. So he would go in and, and you know, find food and, and have time in there, probably slept there, you know, and would have slept there for nights at a time. I even read some reports, and I don't know whether this is bush legend, but that he ate the insides of tortoises or turtles at the yeah, zoo? Yeah, he ripped off the head of oh. a turtle. I think that was at the zoo. He ripped off the head of a tortoise and ate the insides. He didn't like worms, he says. <gasps> he tried fried worms and he said they were gross, didn't like those. But, yeah, I think a lot of food scraps. And the thing with toast, that kept coming up over the years. That burnt toast. Burnt toast. If people could smell toast, they'd become wary because he obviously liked toast. If he was in someone's cabin and they had a bread and toast or if he had some leftover bread, he'd toast the bread. Skipping forward to October 2008 and we're at the Misty Mountain Health Retreat and there's a worker there that starts feeling a bit weirded out. Yeah. What was happening to her? I believe that he was watching her and those freaky notes were starting to come again. And this worker, because she was in this remote property, was skinny dipping because she thought she was alone. Yeah. So that must have been so invasive for her. And out in that area, and I will probably talk about it in a bit, but you freak out, you know. And so once those residents became aware of that, you would be very mindful that he could be lurking anywhere. He was known as the ghost of Barrington Tops because he just was here, there and everywhere. And I think from when he got to now and Doc, that's when it kind of really ramped up. Police were always watching him, but it was like cat and mouse, you know, like they'd go somewhere and then he would be somewhere over there or they'd hear about a robbery over a bit further down or, you know, it was like it was you couldn't quite put your finger on him. So now and Doc takes us to about 2011 mm -hmm. and there's a lot of break and enters in quick succession. Mm -hmm. So police were like, right, <laughs> let's get ahead of this. What did that operation look like? What did they organise? Well, by then, by the time he's hit now and Doc, he's done six years on the run. So his health and his well-being has deteriorated greatly. Like he's tired because he's been on the run for a long time. And police by then had worked out how they could lure him. So they were doing things like, you know, planting sleeping bags or putting food in certain homes but liaising with the owners of those properties that this is what they were doing. Yeah, right. So they were trying to lure him, but then he kept getting away and it was getting really frustrating for police because he'd had a lot of practice. He knew how to survive. You know, I think it was like some 30 properties he says he broke into over the years. So by the time we hit now and Doc, he's experienced. Mm. And even the sharpest police officers are all on the job by this stage and ones that know him and his movements, they're all at the centre of the command post. But he just kept getting away. And then when they went in to the campsite on the day that the officer was shot, mm -hmm. I mean, that was, it just spurred them on. Once one of their own went down, it was like, game on. Malcolm Naden, one of New South Wales' most wanted criminals, also one of the most slippery. For six years, the accused murderer has evaded capture. Yesterday morning, detectives thought they had him cornered, closing in on a remote campsite near Now and Dock. But the fugitive dodged another bullet. A senior constable wasn't so lucky. As police approached that campsite, they were fired upon. One shot which struck the officer. The bullet piercing his right shoulder. He's in good condition. He's certainly stable. Uh, he's expected to make a full recovery. It's the seventh major search operation for Naden since his 2005 disappearance. So when you say campsite, did they come across where he'd been Yeah, sleeping? I think, well, there were a number of them. Yeah, right. There wasn't just one campsite. Uh, now, Malcolm had a lot of shelters that he'd made. So it was one of them that they had cornered, I think it was like 5.30 or 5.45 in the morning or something, and they'd cornered it and went to approach it. But he had stolen a rifle from one of the huts, so he was armed, and just shot straight at an officer and went down. 
And I think, you know, the quote from police after that, it was no holds barred after that. Like that annoyed them because they'd so desperately wanted them. They'd put so much time, resources and money into this manhunt that then he's just shot one of their own. Was that officer okay? Like what happened to him? Yeah, he was. He made a full recovery. He was okay. I think it just rattled everyone though because they knew then that he was armed. And is this when you came into the story? How did you start reporting yeah, on so it? Yeah, so as a reporter who started at Wynn in the Central West, I always had known about Malcolm Naden and the detectives. I worked a fair bit out at Dubbo, so I, I knew them and I knew that they'd been a part of it. But when he got to Now and Doc, I, by then I was at Channel 9 as a crime reporter, so I deployed straight out there once one of the police officers had been shot. And it just grew. The hunt for him just grew and grew and grew from there. Like they were just so determined. I guess you got a, a taste of the police frustration because every time you'd think you had him, he'd disappear. Oh, and we, <laughs> over the months that followed, as a reporter, you would deploy. And as soon as you'd see like a police release or you'd get a phone call saying, oh, there's no, we're, we're closing in, you'd all run up to <laughs> the Barrington Tops and then you'd be there for like four or five days and then you'd come home again because they didn't get him. As all the media, when you'd go to places like Now and Doc, you would stay in people's homes because there's no motels in places like Now and Doc. Oh. So you knew when you went to bed, when you were up there for one or two weeks, you knew that he was out there. And I just remember so many nights lying awake in bed in someone's home and hearing a noise out there. And I just, I was always so scared of seeing his face peering through a window. That's so creepy. Because you were right there and that's what he was doing. And it's one of the most poignant things of my whole coverage of his story is being actually afraid like the rest of the community because you knew he was there and you knew that he was so sneaky and he was so quick. So you really became part of the hunt as a journalist on the story. So when you say you were staying in people's houses, does that mean police are also staying in, you know, citizens' well, houses? These towns are so remote. There's no accommodation. and. Of course, the police had to be near, but covering it there, you can't be 10, 20 minutes and sometimes even half an hour down the road and something happen, you'll miss it. So absolutely, we would be on the way there and you got to know the locals and find the ones that you'd stay with, but you'd be ringing up locals and they were beautiful. They probably felt a bit of security knowing if they were having a team of police officers stay or other people come and stay with them because people were genuinely scared about where is this bloke? Mm. Like he must be close to here because the police are here. The command post is here. He's in somewhere around this area, but no one knew. We shared one night. It was this really beautiful house. That, and again, the people didn't live there. They came, they drove from Newcastle that day because we'd obviously contacted them or the police had and said, look, we need accommodation. They drove all the way back from Newcastle and the police were in one side, like down in one part of the accommodation. And we were up in the house with this beautiful husband and wife that had <laughs> driven from Newcastle. And I tell you, they came with their bags of groceries and I'm like, what are all these for? And they made us the most beautiful dinner. And we got to sit there and debrief and talk about it. And this was a huge event happening in their backyard. But you just like those beautiful stories, those beautiful moments, like where you, you know, you're sitting around, they wash the police clothes for them. Oh my gosh. Because they were there for weeks. Mm. You couldn't leave. Like too much had been invested and they needed to get him. Like you couldn't just come in for a little bit and leave again. They were there for the long haul. They weren't going to leave without their man. And as the media were there and covering it, because I mean, everyone was tuning into it. It was all over the news, the radio, everywhere. You were right in there with it. You were living this manhunt with the police. It gives you a real insight into that, you know, like Australian camaraderie, community. We were commandeering horses to get up to certain rugged terrain to where the search was because you, there was no way by road. So we were finding locals that I remember one story I did, we were on horseback because we <laughs> couldn't walk up there. But it was a story you had to be close to because anything could happen at any time. And police so desperately wanted something to happen. So they just never took their eye off the prize. Like they were working day and night to locate him and then work out how they get in and get him. And then it was getting a bit embarrassing for yeah, police as right. well because there was another sighting at, at another hut where they actually came face to face with him, but he dropped his gun and ran and he got away again. I also wanted to touch on the way Australians reacted while he was on the run because you would suspect, I guess a large majority were 
scared that this man was on the run. But there were also like weird signs popping up outside pubs that were like referring to him and as this Ned is the Kelly. Thing. He got this notoriety, you yeah. know, and I guess as as the reporter too, and, and obviously I was always in close contact with the families of Letitia and Christie mm. and the fuss over the manhunt and the theatre of it really took away from the fact that this was a story about two young mums who lost their lives. Mm. And I've always been really, really conscious of that, that there are victims at the centre of this. But, you know, when it involved police shootings and this game of cat and mouse and it just captured every, and it was, it was just like you couldn't take your eyes off it for for some months there. That's how intense it was. And it was like he was here and then he was gone. And this was just a man from Dubbo. But it just seems like the police were constantly up against it to try and get him. And just, yeah, time and time was going on. Yeah, I mean, I think some pubs named Malcolm Burgers. Which is just weird. And I think that that was also frustrating for police too because he was getting this credibility of being this expert bushman. And, Mm. you know, he probably did become an expert, but he was a wanted murderer and they needed to get him. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bass. I'm speaking with Walkley Award-winning journalist Dimity Clancy about Malcolm Naden, one of Australia's most wanted men. Up next, you'll hear exactly how police were able to finally hunt him down after seven years on the run. So it ticks over to 2012. Mm -hmm. We're coming up to you know, seven years on the run Mm -hmm. and police, as you say, they need to nip this in the bud. They need to catch him and get this done. And they come up with a plan involving a hut. Can you take us to the night at Ken's hut in the March of 2012? How did they finally capture Naden? So they had, I believe, some motion sensors and they were very much in contact with the owners of Ken's hut. And they knew that the owner had left there earlier in the evening And the sensor went off around probably leading up to midnight. And they watched it and they were circling it. And then I think just after midnight, a figure walks outside and goes to the toilet, I think. And that's when they decide now's the time. And he hears something. I think one of the police officers actually stepped, I think this was on the arrest night, stepped on some corrugated iron and made a noise and it triggered him. It triggered Naden. Then they knew, well, this is it. Like we either need to go now or we need to or we'll lose run him. or we're going to lose him again. And so they go in and Chuck the dog is there and they approach him and they said stop police, I believe. And then I think he tried to run just to a doorway but then realised he was surrounded. confronted by officers and surrounded. And then he just said, glad it's over, I've had enough. And they had their man. He was really gaunt, dishevelled. They describe him as a man not in good health. He was really, really cooperative, which I think surprised them as well. Yeah. And he was really eloquent and talking to them. And let's remember that this is a man who hadn't really had any contact with society for seven years and they could not believe the way he would speak back to the police officers and how polite and cooperative he was. Malcolm was caked in mud, which I think the officers were thankful for because he didn't smell. And he was just really cooperative and just went with police. And I remember being in my bed and I was super cranky that it was 3am and I was fast asleep and I just, my phone rang and I picked it up and it said, we've got him, get up here. (laughs) And I was like... Oh, my God. Yeah, but he'd been arrested for three hours. I was cranky. (laughs) Oh, you were cranky you didn't get woken up at midnight. Gotcha. (laughs) Yeah, so then we just scrambled up there. Yeah, because to get the the morning news, you're going to miss it. Yeah, they were like, quickly, get up, get up, get up as soon as you can. And then it was just, yeah, it was all on for days after that. So obviously the first thing they want to do is get him in a room and interview him. Mm. And you said that he was cooperative. Mm. What was he telling them in that initial interview? Did he start talking about the crimes? He didn't talk about the murders. Right. And he said he didn't want to talk about the murders, but he talked about the break and enters. I think he talked about the the police shooting. I'm not sure whether that was initially. He was happy to discuss all of that, but 
wouldn't talk about the murders. Right. And that was really frustrating because I think circumstantially police had a great case, but that was no certainty in a court of law. How were they going to prove that he killed Christy and Letitia? Without him saying it. Without him saying it, without him confessing. They clearly obviously didn't have enough without his confession to charge him there and then. So they they really had to work for it and they had to work out how can they get the confession out of him if he's not willing to talk about it. We've already talked throughout this interview. He's done a 25-page mm. everything on the table, mm. what he did confession. How did they get that? They visited him a number of times in jail and talked around it, I think, and then eventually they said to him, if you don't want to talk, how about you write things down? And they left him with a wad of paper, like a notebook and a pen, and said, feel free to write down anything you'd like to tell us. They had no idea what he was going to write down. They had no idea that he was going to hand them back 25 pages of neat, eloquent writing that would not only get the confessions they needed but give them such insight into who this man really was. I know you've just handed me when we walked into this studio the confession and I'm actually taken aback by just how neat it is. It looks like, you know, the perfect kind of handwriting and he's even like crossed bits out to write the correct spelling Mm. and it seems to be grammatically correct and like you said, it's not the picture you have in your head of, what this man might be or how he might write. How did you come across this confession? Do you remember reading it for the first time? I always knew it existed and I always knew that one day it could be a story to tell because Mm. I think we knew so much about the manhunt. We knew so much about Malcolm. We knew so much about Letitia and Christy. But we didn't know why. And actually... The families of Letitia and Christie didn't know why or what happened, really. And I remember when I got the confession and I read it and I was like, my God, the first thing I thought of was Joan Nolan, yeah. Letitia's mum. And I thought to myself, as a mum, how would I feel having that in the public domain? Like, is this a story to really to be told? And I remember I was really nervous ringing up Joni. I didn't know how she was going to react, but I thought I just wanted to float it with her, like I'm telling her about it, and she hadn't seen it. And I said, you know, how would you feel if I did a story about Malcolm's confession? And I said, you know, it's really brutal. And I said, but there's like all the bad parts, obviously out of respect we wouldn't include, but you can't anyway like to reassure her that the court had redacted big chunks of it. And she said, you know what, if you tell that story, maybe everybody will know what a bad person he is. Mm. And I thought I was so shocked by that reaction because I wasn't expecting it. But And that's when I got her blessing to to tell that. And, and I think the most compelling thing of it is the insight into such a depraved murderer's mind. Yeah, and it just gave answers, I think, that so many people wanted to know about this man. I mean, he was Australia's most wanted man. He was the expert bushman outsmarting police. And it just just shaped exactly who he was. It just gave great insight. Then my next challenge was how do I turn 25 pages into a compelling television, <laughs> 20 minutes of television, <laughs> which has a story in itself of how we did it because, you know, we decided, oh, we'll get an actor to play Malcolm and, and here I am like I'm a journo. I don't, I, I'm there on agency websites <laughs> looking searching. for actors. Yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing? Like who are these people sitting on websites and... We ended up actually using, I remember driving in one morning and the security guard at the front of Channel 9, I looked up and I was like, if I shaved your head, shaved your beard, I reckon you could play Malcolm Naden. And so I pulled over and went back to the security gate and he actually was the person who played it, was the security guard at Channel 9. So, And he was up for shaving his head? He was all up for it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, then we were like, oh, how do we tell it, you know? So we got him to read it off an auto cue. And we hired, one of our cameramen is like the the soccer president, so so we hired a toilet block on the northern beaches to be the jail cell (laughs) and (laughs) got an auto cue into the toilets and got him sitting in his his prison greens and actually reading the confession. Watching your package and watching this security guard turned actor read out the confession, it does give it that sinister 
edge that you probably wouldn't be able to get if you just said it in another context. Some of the lines that jumped out to me, once you kill someone, you do it again, you just don't care. Like things like that, that kind of give you that insight. And conscience is like a wall. Once you knock it down, you can't build it back up. It's stuff like that, that once again, they're very smart, eloquent ways of thinking, but Mm. they're just creepy. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he quotes Shakespeare, he quotes a Hollywood movie. It's just a train of thought on paper. You could just feel him almost writing it as you're reading it. And in terms of when he starts to detail how he murdered these two women, I guess the casual nature in which he does that, is that something that shocked you? Oh, I don't know. I've probably dealt with too many murderers over the years, <laughs> but I think that Malcolm just doesn't have a sense of being able to feel, and he admits that. But there's also other little things, little moments in the Naden story that you see that he does have some sort of conscience. Like I said in the Letitia, you know, when he moves her into a more comfortable position, yeah, yeah. that he was looking at Letitia after she died and that she was really beautiful and that he felt bad for her. But he was obviously very conscious of the fact that he can murder again because he wanted a life sentence. You know, it's the only time I think in the officer's experience and in my experience that you go into a courtroom and all the murderer wants is a life sentence. He did not want to get out. Why? Because he doesn't want to kill kill again. And that was his home. And he doesn't describe his life on the run as fun or like he says it was tough and that he'd been dealt that ill fate and that he didn't want that life again, that life for him now was in jail and that's where he'll die. So why didn't he walk into a police station? Why didn't he give himself up? I don't know because I don't think when he went on the run that he wanted to be caught, but I think over the years he just got so tired of constantly having to flee. And if he stayed on the run, he probably never had to face what he did. Mm. And I don't mean that in terms of punishment. I mean that in terms of having to think about it and having to deal with it. Because he makes note of that. When he gets arrested, he says to the police, I need to gather my thoughts on all of that before I talk to you about the murders. He's been in prison now for 11-ish years, Mm. you know, more than a decade. Do we know much about what his life has been like in prison or what he's no. like now? No, I, I don't. I know he's in Supermax. Mm. He's in Goulburn Supermax. I know he shared a cell with a relative or had some sort of contact with a relative who badly injured him. He oh, him. okay. Yeah. And what about Letitia? He obviously went into great detail about where he left Letitia's body, what he did to her. Was she found? So he actually agreed to be taken from jail back to Butler's Falls. But because the terrain had changed so much, nothing showed up and he couldn't exactly, there was like a 100 metre span of where he said that he'd buried her. Then afterwards a bone was found by a member of the public and examined and was proven to belong to Letitia. And that was incredible because I think they then discovered a couple of other bones. But that gave Letitia's children and her mum something of her, some closure. And they were able to actually have and set up a little, like, shrine and, and, you know, a little grave, I guess, and able to actually say goodbye to her. Because their mum's murder for Letitia's children is all they've ever known. The media fuss, the manhunt. And so those children really needed that. And Joan needed it too. Because she had four children, young children. She had four children. beautiful children and by all accounts she was just a dedicated, lovely, she loved being a mum and she always wanted to be a mum. Not to pry into, you know, there's six kids here in this story mm-hmm. that have been left without mums, but they've been surrounded by family. They've got a big family. They have a big family. And, you know, Joni and Arnie Marg, who I've dealt with most over the years, they're just such beautiful people and as Marg will say, like he won't break the family. He hasn't divided the family. Malcolm was Malcolm. And that's kind of how the family thought of him, that Malcolm, he was just Malcolm. You know, he stayed in his room. He was a recluse. He didn't want to to be a part of much. And that's who he was. But, you know, for so many years, they had to sit there without any answers, you know, of of where Letitia was, why he would do that to Christy. 
So you hope that when he was captured and, and the fact that he pled guilty saved them from years probably of having to go through the courts. Yeah. You hope that they have some some closure and, you know, are happy that he can't do it to somebody else. I think they've said those words to me that, you know, he can't he can't hurt anyone else and that's the main thing. But, you know, what a story for you to have to grow up with mm. of what happened to your mum or what happened to your daughter. And that is really at the heart of this story. This isn't a story about Malcolm Naden. He's just the offender. This is a story about two mums who lost their lives and kids that had to grow up without their mum. And that's the most important part that people need to remember about this story. But he is now away and he, there's no parole and he will spend the rest of his life in jail and that's where Malcolm Naden belongs. Thanks to Dimity for assisting us to tell this story. If you want to see Dimity's award-winning coverage of Malcolm Naden's confession, we've linked it in the show notes for you. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversations.